in November 1842, Abraham Lincoln and his new wife Mary moved into their first home in Springfield, Illinois, a small rented room on the second floor of the Globe Tavern. It was the worst place Mary had ever lived. She grew up in Lexington, Kentucky, attended by slaves in the elegant home of her father, a prosperous merchant and banker. In contrast, the room was the nicest place Abraham had ever lived. Nineteen years later, the Lincolns moved into the presidential mansion in Washington, D.C. Abraham Lincoln climbed from the Globe Tavern to the White House by work, ambition, and talent. Lincoln and many others celebrated his rise from backwoods poverty as an example of the opportunities available in the free labor economy of the North and West. They believed his spectacular ascent came from his individual qualities. They tended to ignore the help he received from Mary and many other people. Born in Kentucky in 1809, Lincoln grew up on small, struggling farms as his family migrated west. His father, Thomas Lincoln, born in Virginia, never learned to read. Lincoln's mother, Nancy, could neither read nor write. In 1816, Thomas Lincoln moved his young family from Kentucky to the Indiana wilderness where there was absolutely nothing to excite ambition for education, Lincoln wrote. Unlike Lincoln, Mary Todd spent 10 years in Lexington's best private schools for young women. In 1830, Thomas Lincoln moved to central Illinois. When he moved again a year later, Abraham set out on his own, a friendless, uneducated, penniless boy, as he described himself. By constant striving, Abraham Lincoln gained an education and the respect of his Illinois neighbors, although he did not earn a steady income for years. After he got married, Lincoln received help from Mary's father. He gave the couple 80 acres of land and a yearly allowance of about $1,100 for six years. That helped them move out of their room above the Globe Tavern and into their own home. Abraham eventually built a thriving law practice in Springfield, Illinois, and served in the state legislature and in Congress. Mary helped him in many ways, rearing their sons, tending their household, and integrating him into her wealthy and influential family in Illinois and Kentucky. Mary also shared Abraham's keen interest in politics and ambition for power. With her support, Abraham became the first president born west of the Appalachian Mountains. Like Lincoln, millions of Americans believed they could make something of themselves, whatever their origins, so long as they were willing to work. Individuals who were lazy, undisciplined, or foolish had only themselves to blame if they failed, advocates of free labor ideology declared. Work was a requirement for success, not a guarantee. This emphasis on work highlighted the individual efforts of men and tended to overlook the many crucial contributions women and family members made to the successes of men like Lincoln. In addition, the rewards of work tilted toward white men and away from women and free African Americans, as anti-slavery and women's rights reformers pointed out. Still, the promise of rewards for work spurred efforts that shaped the contours of America. Plowing new fields and building railroads pushed the boundaries of the nation westward to the Pacific Ocean. The nation's economic, political, and geographic expansion raised the question of whether slavery should also move west. Lincoln and other Americans confronted that question following the Mexican-American War, yet another outgrowth of the nation's westward movement. During the 1840s and 1850s, Americans experienced impressive economic growth. Since 1800, the total output of the U.S. economy had multiplied 12-fold. Four developments in American society fueled this remarkable economic growth. First, millions of Americans moved from farms to towns and cities, Abraham Lincoln among them. Second, factory workers, mainly in towns and cities, increased to about 20% of the labor force. Third, a shift from water power to steam as a source of energy raised productivity, especially in factories and transportation. Railroads harnessed steam power, speeding transport and cutting costs. Fourth, agricultural productivity nearly doubled during Lincoln's lifetime, spurring the nation's economic growth more than any other factor. Historians often refer to this cascade of changes as an industrial revolution. However, these changes did not cause a total revolution in America's economy or society, which remained overwhelmingly agricultural. Old methods of production continued alongside new ones. A better term for the changes in the American economy during the 1840s and 1850s is industrial evolution. Agriculture was the foundation of the United States' economic growth. A French traveler noted that Americans had a general feeling of hatred against trees. 
Trees limited agricultural productivity because farmers had to spend time and energy clearing them to make fields open to sunlight and cultivation. When farmers pushed westward looking for cheap land, like Lincoln, they came to the Midwest's comparatively treeless prairie where they could spend less time clearing land and more time with a plow and hoe. Rich prairie soils yielded bumper crops, enticing farmers to migrate to the Midwest by the tens of thousands between 1830 and 1860. The populations of Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Iowa exploded tenfold between 1830 and 1860, much faster than the growth of the nation as a whole. Labor-saving improvements in farm implements also boosted agricultural productivity. Inventors tinkered to craft stronger, more efficient plows. In 1837, John Deere made a strong, smooth steel plow that sliced through hard prairie soil so cleanly that farmers called it the singing plow. Deere's company produced more than 10,000 plows a year by the late 1850s. Human and animal muscles provided the energy for plowing, but Deere's plows permitted farmers to break more ground and plant more crops. Improvements in wheat harvesting also increased farmers' productivity. In 1840, most farmers harvested wheat by hand, cutting two or three acres a day. In the 1830s, Cyrus McCormick and others experimented with designs for a mechanical reaper, and by the 1840s, a McCormick reaper that cost between $100 and $150 allowed a farmer to harvest 12 acres a day. Improved reapers and plows, usually powered by horses or oxen, allowed farmers to cultivate more land, doubling the corn and wheat harvest between 1840 and 1860. Federal land policy made possible the leap in agricultural productivity. Up to 1860, the United States continued to be land rich and labor poor. The nation became much richer in land with the Louisiana Purchase, and the federal government made most of this land available for purchase in order to attract settlers and to generate money for government expenses. Millions of ordinary farmers bought federal land for a dollar and a quarter an acre, or $50 for a 40-acre farm that could support a family. Millions of other farmers squatted on unclaimed federal land, as Thomas Lincoln did, and carved out farms. By making land available on relatively easy terms, federal land policy boosted agricultural productivity, which in turn fueled the nation's economic growth. Changes in manufacturing arose from the nation's land-rich, labor-poor economy. In Europe's land-poor, labor-rich economies, few opportunities in agriculture created plenty of factory workers and kept wages low. In the United States, Western expansion and government land policy supported agriculture, keeping millions of people on the farm. 80% of the nation's 31 million people lived in rural areas in 1860. The large agricultural workforce limited the supply of workers for manufacturing and in turn elevated wages. Because of the relative shortage of workers, American manufacturers searched constantly for ways to save labor and reduce their costs. Mechanization allowed manufacturers to produce more with less labor. In general, factory workers produced twice as much per unit of labor as agricultural workers. Some manufacturers began making interchangeable parts and then assembling them into more or less uniform products. This process became known as the American system. It started in gun making and spread to other industries. Standardized parts made by machine also allowed manufacturers to employ unskilled workers who were much cheaper than highly trained craftsmen. Despite mechanization, factories remained small. Even in heavily mechanized industries, factories rarely employed more than 20 or 30 workers. Manufacturing and agriculture meshed into a dynamic national economy. New England led the nation in manufacturing, shipping goods such as guns, clocks, plows, and axes west and south. Southern and western states sent commodities such as wheat, pork, whiskey, tobacco, and cotton north and east. Between 1840 and 1860, coal production in Pennsylvania, Ohio, and elsewhere multiplied eightfold, cutting coal prices in half and powering the many coal-fired steam engines. Even so, by 1860, coal accounted for more than a fifth of the nation's energy consumption. Even in manufacturing, muscles provided 30 times more energy than steam did. American manufacturers specialized in producing for the huge domestic market rather than for export. British goods dominated the international market, and they were usually cheaper and better than American-made products. 
U.S. manufacturers supported tariffs to raise prices on British goods, but their best protection from British competitors came from pleasing their American customers, most of whom were farmers. The developing economy was accelerated by railroads, which linked farmers and factories in new ways. Railroads captured Americans' imagination because they seemed to break the bonds of nature. When canals and rivers froze in winter or became impassable during summer droughts, trains steamed ahead, averaging more than 20 miles an hour during the 1850s. Above all, railroads gave cities not blessed with canals or navigable rivers a way to compete for rural trade. In 1850, trains steamed along 9,000 miles of track, almost two-thirds of it in New England and the Middle Atlantic states. By 1860, several railroads spanned the Mississippi River, connecting frontier farmers to the nation's 30,000 miles of track, approximately as much as in all of the rest of the world combined. In 1857, for example, France had only 3,700 miles of track, while England and Wales had 6,400 miles. The massive expansion of American railroads helped catapult the nation to the world's second greatest industrial power after Great Britain. In addition to speeding transportation, railroads propelled the growth of other industries, such as iron and communications. Iron production grew five times faster than the population during the decades up to 1860, in part to meet railroads' demand. Railroads also stimulated the emerging telegraph industry. In 1844, Samuel F. B. Morse demonstrated the potential of his telegraph by transmitting an electronic message between Washington, D.C. and Baltimore. By 1861, more than 50,000 miles of telegraph wires stretched across the continent to the Pacific Ocean, often alongside railroad tracks, accelerating communication of all sorts. Private corporations built and owned almost all American railroads, in contrast to the government-owned railroads in other industrial nations. But privately owned American railroads received massive government aid, especially federal land grants. Up to 1850, the federal government had granted a total of 7 million acres of federal land to various turnpike, highway, and canal projects. In 1850, Congress approved a grant to railroads of six square miles of federal land for each mile of track laid. By 1860, Congress had granted railroads more than 20 million acres of federal land. These land grants supported railroad construction costs and promoted the expansion of the rail network, the settlement of federal land, and the integration of the domestic market. The railroad boom of the 1850s demonstrated the growing industrial might of the American economy. Like other industries, railroads succeeded because they served both farms and cities, but transportation was not revolutionized overnight. Most Americans in 1860 were far more familiar with horses than with locomotives. Even by 1875, trains carried only about one-third of the mail. Most of the rest still went by horseback or stagecoach. The economy of the 1840s and 1850s linked an expanding, westward-moving population in farms and cities with muscles, animals, machines, steam, and railroads. Abraham Lincoln planted corn and split fence rails as a young man before he moved to Springfield, Illinois, and became a successful attorney who defended railroad corporations, among others. His mobility, westward, from farm to city, from manual to mental labor, and upward, illustrated the direction of economic change and the opportunities that beckoned enterprising individuals. The nation's impressive economic performance did not reward all Americans equally. Native-born white men tended to do better than immigrants. With few exceptions, women were excluded from opportunities open to men. Tens of thousands of women worked as seamstresses, laundresses, domestic servants, factory hands, and teachers, but they had little opportunity to aspire to higher-paying jobs. In the North and West, slavery was slowly eliminated in the half-century after the American Revolution, but most free African Americans had dead-end jobs as laborers and servants. Discrimination against immigrants, women, and free black people did not trouble most white men. With certain notable exceptions, they considered discrimination proper and just, the outcome of a free labor system that rewarded hard work and, ideally, education. During the 1840s and 1850s, leaders throughout the North and West emphasized a set of ideas that seemed to explain why the changes underway in their society benefited some people more than others. They referred again and again to the advantages of what they termed free labor, the word free here refers to laborers who were not slaves, of course. 
By the 1850s, free labor ideas described a social and economic ideal that accounted for both the successes and the shortcomings of the economy and society taking shape in the North and West. Spokesmen for the free labor ideal celebrated hard work, self-reliance, and independence. They proclaimed that the door to success was open not just to those who inherited wealth or high status, but also to self-made men such as Abraham Lincoln. Free labor, Lincoln argued, was the just and generous and prosperous system which opens the way for all, gives hope to all, and energy and progress and improvement of condition to all. Free labor permitted the farmer and the artisan to enjoy the products of their own labor, and it also benefited wage workers. The prudent, penniless beginner in the world, Lincoln declared, labors for wages a while, saves a surplus with which to buy tools or land for himself, then labors on his own account another while, and at length hires another new beginner to help him. Wage labor, Lincoln claimed, was the first rung on the ladder that reached upward to self-employment and eventually to hiring others. The free labor ideal proclaimed a democratic vision of human potential. Lincoln and other spokesmen stressed the importance of universal education. Throughout the North and West, communities supported public schools to make learning available to young children. In rural areas, where the labor of children was difficult to spare, schools typically enrolled no more than half the school-aged children. Textbooks and teachers, most of whom were young women, drummed into students the lessons of the free labor system, self-reliance, discipline, and, above all else, hard work. Remember that all the ignorance, degradation, and misery in the world is the result of indolence and vice, one textbook intoned. Both in and outside school, free labor ideology emphasized labor as much as freedom. The free labor ideal made sense to many Americans in the North and West who believed it described their own experiences. Money seemed to many the best measure of success. Despite the impressive growth of industry, the United States remained essentially an agrarian nation, but the profits from cash crop agriculture in the South, staple crop agriculture in the Midwest, and northern industry led to a rapidly widening gap between landowners and the landless, between rich and poor. By the 1830s, most farmers were tenant farmers, the independent yeomanry rapidly losing ground to southern plantation magnates and Midwestern and Mid-Atlantic commercial farmers, though a fortunate minority did move from the ranks of the yeomanry to become commercial farmers, and small planters moved up to becoming large planters in the South. Although some people from the lower ranks thus moved up, due to rising birth rates, increased immigration, and the dwindling availability of developed land, more people came to occupy the ranks of the working class, whom we today would call the working poor. In the cities, the numbers of artisans were similarly shrinking as factories began to squeeze them out with cheaper products made by low-wage workers operating on a system known as piecework, meaning that groups of workers only made a specific piece of an item while another group performed the final assembly. Men working in factories for about 12 hours per day with Sundays off usually made four times as much in wages than their female counterparts, earning as much as $12 per week, while women usually only made about 3 or $4. A man could sustain himself and a wife or possibly a small family on such wages in very modest circumstances, and factory workers tended to enjoy reasonable job security, though often under conditions that varied from unhealthy to downright dangerous. Women fared only a little better in this regard. Very few below the professional class living in the cities owned their homes, and so the vast majority rented from landlords. In the countryside, land ownership became increasingly concentrated in fewer hands, such that more than 60% of the people living outside of the cities owned any land and most landowners enjoyed large holdings that generated great wealth for them. Few women were independent landowners, and those who did and then got married lost control of their holdings to their husbands. Free African Americans were in a still worse condition, 90% of whom owned no land, and most of them being unskilled or semi-skilled laborers. Free labor spokesmen considered these economic inequalities a natural outgrowth of freedom, the inevitable result of some individuals being luckier, more able, and more willing to work. The inequalities also demonstrate the gap between the promise and the performance of the free labor ideal.
economic growth permitted many men to move from being landless squatters to landowning farmers and from being hired laborers to independent self-employed producers. But many more Americans remained behind, landless and working for wages. Even those who realized their aspirations often had a precarious hold on their independence. Bad debts, failing prices, crop failure, sickness, or death could quickly eliminate a family's gains. Americans' pursuit of free labor ideals created restless social and geographic mobility. While fortunate people such as Abraham Lincoln rose far beyond their social origins, others shared the misfortune of a merchant who, an observer noted, has been on the sinking list all his life. In search of better prospects, roughly two-thirds of the rural population moved every decade, and population turnover in cities was even greater. The risks and uncertainties of free labor did not deter millions of immigrants from entering the United States between the 1840s and 1850s. Almost four and a half million immigrants arrived between 1840 and 1860, six times more than had come during the previous two decades. Nearly three-fourths of the immigrants who arrived between 1840 and 1860 came from either Germany or Ireland. The majority of the 1.4 million Germans who entered during these years were skilled tradesmen and their families. Roughly one quarter were farmers, many of whom settled in Texas. German Americans were often Protestants. They usually were the kind of independent producers celebrated by free labor spokesmen. Relatively few worked as wage laborers or domestic servants. Irish immigrants, in contrast, entered at the bottom of the free labor ladder and struggled to climb up. Nearly 1.7 million Irish immigrants arrived between 1840 and 1860, nearly all of them desperately poor and often weakened by hunger and disease. Potato blight caused a deadly famine in Ireland in 1845, and it returned repeatedly year after year. Many Irish people crowded into ships and sailed to America, where they settled in northeastern cities. Roughly three out of four Irish immigrants worked as wage laborers or domestic servants. Irish men dug canals, loaded ships, laid railroad track, and did odd jobs. Irish women worked in the homes of others, cooking, washing, ironing, minding children, and cleaning house. Almost all Irish immigrants were Catholic, which set them apart from the overwhelmingly Protestant native-born Americans. Many Americans regarded the Irish as hard-drinking, unruly, half-civilized folk. Job announcements commonly stated, No Irish need apply. One immigrant recalled that Irish laborers were thought of as nothing more than dogs, despised and kicked about. Despite such prejudices, Americans hired Irish immigrants because they accepted very low pay and worked hard. In America's labor-poor economy, Irish laborers could earn more in one day than in several weeks in Ireland, but many immigrants also craved respect and decent working conditions. The opportunities for immigrants and native-born laborers often did not live up to the optimistic vision outlined by the free labor ideal. Many wage laborers could not realistically aspire to become independent, self-sufficient property holders despite the claims of Abraham Lincoln and other free labor proponents. Beginning in the 1840s, the nation's expanding population, booming economy, and boundless confidence propelled a new era of rapid westward migration. Under the banner of Manifest Destiny, Americans moved west of the Mississippi River where they encountered American Indians who inhabited the plains, deserts, and rugged coasts of the West, the British who claimed the Oregon country, and the Mexicans whose flag flew over the vast expanse of the Southwest. Nevertheless, by 1850, the United States stretched to the Pacific and included the Utah Territory with its Mormon settlement. Frontier settlers took the land and then, with the exception of the Mormons, lobbied the federal government to acquire the territory they had settled. The human cost of expansion was high. The young Mexican nation lost a war and half of its territory. Two centuries of Indian Wars, which ended east of the Mississippi during the 1830s, continued for another half century in the West. Most Americans believed that their superior institutions and white skin bestowed on them a God-given right to spread across the continent. This conceit is based on the Christian belief in millennialism, meaning the thousand-year-long era of peace and prosperity during which Christianity rules the world before the Second Coming, 
and American Christians as far back as the Puritans of the late 17th century believed that America would be the seat of the millennial kingdom. Americans, whether devoutly Christian or not, believed that the West had become their birthright and that nothing can or should prevent them from taking full possession of the lands beyond the Mississippi River all the way to the Pacific Ocean. They imagined the West as a howling wilderness, empty and undeveloped. If they recognized Indians and Mexicans at all, they dismissed them as primitives who would have to be redeemed, shoved aside, or exterminated. The West provided young men especially an arena in which to show their manhood. Most Americans believed that the West needed the civilizing power of the hammer and the plow, the ballot box and the pulpit, which had transformed the East. In 1845, a New York magazine edited by John L. O'Sullivan coined the term Manifest Destiny to justify white settlers taking the land they wanted. O'Sullivan called on Americans to resist any effort to thwart the fulfillment of our manifest destiny to overspread the continent allotted by Providence for the free development of our yearly multiplying millions and for the development of the great experiment of liberty and federative self-government entrusted to us. Almost overnight, the magic phrase manifest destiny swept the nation, providing a defense for conquering the West. As important as national pride and racial arrogance were to manifest destiny, land hunger drew hundreds of thousands of Americans westward. Some politicians believed that national prosperity depended on capturing the rich trade of Asia. To trade with the Far East, the United States needed the Pacific Coast ports that stretched from San Diego to Puget Sound. The United States and Asia must talk together and trade together, Missouri Senator Thomas Hart Benton declared. In the 1840s, American economic expansion came wrapped in talk of uplift and civilization. American expansionists and the British competed for the Oregon country, a vast region bounded on the west by the Pacific Ocean, on the east by the Rocky Mountains, on the south by the 42nd parallel, and on the north by Russian Alaska. In 1818, the United States and Great Britain decided on joint occupation that would leave Oregon free and open to settlement by both countries. By the 1820s, a handful of American fur traders and mountain men roamed the region. In the late 1830s, settlers began to trickle along the Oregon Trail. The first wagon trains headed west in 1841, and by 1843, about 1,000 immigrants a year set out from Independence, Missouri, and other locales. By 1869, when the first transcontinental railroad was completed, approximately 350,000 migrants had traveled west in wagon trains. Immigrants encountered the Plains Indians, a quarter of a million Native Americans scattered over the area between the Mississippi River and the Rocky Mountains. Some were farmers who lived peaceful, settled lives, but a majority, the Sioux, Cheyenne, Shoshone, and Arapaho of the Central Plains, and the Kiowa, Wichita, and Comanche of the Southern Plains were horse-mounted, nomadic, non-agricultural peoples whose warriors symbolized the quote-unquote savage Indian in the minds of whites. Horses, which had been brought to North America by Spaniards in the 16th century, permitted the Plains tribes to become highly mobile hunters of buffalo. They came to depend on buffalo for nearly everything, food, clothing, shelter, and fuel. Competition for buffalo led to war between the tribes. Young men were introduced to warfare early, learning to ride ponies at breakneck speed while firing off arrows and, later, rifles with astounding accuracy. A Comanche on his feet is out of his element, observed Western artist George Catlin. But the moment he lays his hands upon his horse, his face even becomes handsome, and he gradually flies away like a different being. The Plains Indians struck fear in the hearts of whites on the wagon trains, but Native Americans had far more to fear from whites. Indians killed fewer than 400 immigrants on the trails between 1840 and 1860, while whites brought alcohol and deadly pandemics, and white hunters slaughtered buffalo for the international hide market and sometimes just for sport. The government constructed a chain of forts along the Oregon Trail and adopted a new Indian policy, concentration. In 1851, at the Fort Laramie Conference, the government persuaded the Plains Indians to sign agreements that cleared a wide corridor for wagon trains by restricting Native Americans 
to specific areas that whites promised they would never violate. This policy of concentration became the seedbed for the subsequent policy of reservations. But whites would not keep out of Indian territory, and Indians would not easily give up their traditional ways of life. Struggle for control of the West meant warfare for decades to come. Still, Indians threatened immigrants less than life on the trail did. Immigrants could count on at least six months of hard travel. With nearly 2,000 miles to go and making no more than 15 miles a day, the pioneers endured parching heat, drought, treacherous rivers, disease, physical and emotional exhaustion, and, if the snows closed the mountain passes before they got through, freezing and starvation. Women faced the ordeal of trailside childbirth. It was said that a person could walk from Missouri to the Pacific, stepping only on the graves of those who had died heading west. Not every wagon train heading west was bound for the Pacific Slope. One remarkable group of religious immigrants halted near the Great Salt Lake in what was then Mexican territory. After years of persecution in the east, the Mormons fled west to find religious freedom and communal security. Neighbors branded Mormons heretics and drove their founder, Joseph Smith Jr., and his followers from New York to Ohio, then to Missouri, and finally in 1839 to Nauvoo, Illinois, where they built a prosperous community. But after Smith sanctioned plural marriage, polygamy, non-Mormons arrested Smith and his brother. On June 27, 1844, a mob stormed the jail and shot both men dead. The embattled church turned to an extraordinary new leader, Brigham Young, who oversaw a great exodus. In 1846, traveling in 3,700 wagons, 12,000 Mormons made their way to Iowa and then on to their new home beside the Great Salt Lake. Young described the region as a barren waste, the paradise of the lizard, the cricket, and the rattlesnake. Within 10 years, however, the Mormons developed an irrigation system that made the desert bloom. Under Young's stern leadership, the Mormons built a thriving community using cooperative labor, not the individualistic and competitive enterprise common amongst most immigrants. Young and the Mormon leadership declared sovereignty over an enormous territory just taken by the United States from Mexico following the Mexican War, which I'll come to in a few moments, that they called the State of Deseret. They intended for Deseret to become a state in the Union, but with a theocratic government, meaning that Mormon clergy would also serve as the political leadership, with the governorship essentially passing down through Young's descendants due to his status as reigning prophet. This, of course, goes against the forms of democracy and egalitarianism, and incorporation would mean forcing the Mormons to establish a constitution that conformed to those of the other states, so for a brief time, the Mormons hoped to rule Deseret as an independent nation, but that was not going to be tolerated either. In 1850, the United States annexed Deseret and renamed it the Utah Territory. Shortly afterward, Brigham Young announced that many Mormons practiced polygamy. Although only one Mormon man in five had more than one wife, Young had 23, Young's statement caused an outcry that forced the U.S. government to establish its authority in Utah. A period of extreme tension followed, as Mormon leaders asserted Deseret's sovereignty and promised to repel any invasion by so-called outsiders. In the summer of 1857, a wagon train that had come from the Arkansas Territory on its way to California stopped in Salt Lake City, then made its way southwest. The migrants camped at a place called Mountain Meadows near the California border, and a force of the Utah Territorial Militia with Paiute Indian allies surrounded the encampment that September. The Paiutes attacked the migrants who defended themselves, but upon sighting the white Mormons standing by, demanded a parley. Under a flag of truce and promising that they were there only to escort the wagon train out of Deseret, the militiamen disarmed the outsiders and proceeded to slaughter everyone, men, women, and teenagers, sparing only the young children who were adopted out to Mormon families. Approximately 140 people lost their lives in what came to be known as the Mountain Meadows Massacre. In 1857, 2,500 U.S. troops invaded Salt Lake City in what was known as the Mormon War. 
the bloodless occupation illustrated that most Americans viewed the Mormons as a threat to American morality and institutions. Brigham Young needed statehood for Deseret if the Mormons were to have any hopes of retaining self-government in the Utah Territory, and so he gave up the militia leaders to federal officials to face murder charges, a decision that most Mormons at the time denounced. In the Mexican Southwest, westward-moving Anglo-American pioneers confronted northern-moving Spanish-speaking frontiersmen. On this frontier is elsewhere. National cultures and interests collided. Mexico won its independence from Spain in 1821, but the young nation was plagued by civil wars, economic crises, and quarrels with the Roman Catholic Church, and devastating raids by the Comanche, Apache, and Kiowa nations. Mexico found it increasingly difficult to defend its sparsely populated northern provinces, especially when faced with a neighbor convinced of its superiority and bent on territorial acquisition. The American assault began quietly. In the 1820s, Anglo-American traders drifted into Santa Fe, a remote outpost in the northern province of New Mexico. The traders made the long trek southwest along the Santa Fe Trail with wagons crammed with inexpensive American-manufactured goods and returned home with Mexican silver, furs, and mules. The Mexican province of Tejas, or Texas, attracted a flood of Americans who had settlement, not long-distance trade, on their minds. Wanting to populate and develop its northern territories, the Mexican government granted the American Stephen F. Austin a huge tract of land along the Brazos River. In the 1820s, when Austin offered land at only 10 cents an acre, thousands of Americans poured across the border. Most were Southerners who brought cotton and slaves with them. A collision was destined to happen. The Mexican Republic established the Roman Catholic Church as the state-supported religion, requiring all citizens who were not already Catholic to convert. This did not sit well with the Protestant Americans who ignored this law. The Mexican government also outlawed slavery, which rankled slave-owning immigrants who flouted this law as well. Mexico City began to penalize the slaveholding and Protestant Anglos through special taxation, which sparked a protest movement. By the 1830s, settlers had established a thriving plantation economy in Texas, Americans numbered 35,000, while the Tejano, Spanish-speaking, population was less than 8,000. Few Anglo-American settlers were Roman Catholic, spoke Spanish, or cared about assimilating into Mexican culture. Afraid of losing Texas to the new arrivals, the Mexican government in 1830 banned further immigration from the United States and outlawed the introduction of additional slaves. Anglo-Americans in Texas made it clear that they wanted to be rid of the despotism of the sword and the priesthood and to govern themselves. When the settlers rebelled, General Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana ordered the Mexican army to San Antonio. The rebels, commanded by Colonel William B. Travis from Alabama and including the Tennessee frontiersman Davy Crockett and the Louisiana adventurer James Bowie, as well as a handful of Tejanos, had occupied a former Franciscan mission known as the Alamo. In February 1836, Santa Ana sent wave after wave of his 2,000-man army crashing against the walls until the attackers finally broke through and killed all 187 rebels. A few weeks later, outside the small town of Goliad, Mexican forces captured and executed almost 400 Texans as pirates and outlaws. In April 1836, at San Jacinto, General Sam Houston's army adopted the massacre of Goliad as a battle cry and crushed Santa Ana's troops in a surprise attack. The Texans had succeeded in establishing the Lone Star Republic, and the following year, the United States recognized the independence of Texas from Mexico. Earlier in 1824, seeking to increase Mexican migration to the province of California, the Mexican government granted ranchos, huge estates devoted to cattle raising, to new settlers. Rancheros ruled over near-feudal empires worked by Indians whose condition sometimes approached that of slaves. In 1834, rancheros persuaded the Mexican government to confiscate the Franciscan missions and make their vast lands available to new settlement. Despite the efforts of the Mexican government, California in 1840 had a population of only 7,000 Mexican settlers. Non-Mexican settlers numbered only 380, but among them were Americans who championed Manifest Destiny. In 
they convinced some American immigrants who were traveling the Oregon Trail to head southwest on the California Trail. The first overland party arrived in California in 1841. Few Americans in California wanted a war, but many dreamed of living again under the U.S. flag. In 1846, American settlers in the Sacramento Valley took matters into their own hands, encouraged by John C. Fremont, a former Army captain and explorer who had arrived with a party of 60 buckskin-clad frontiersmen, the Californians raised an independence movement known as the Bear Flag Revolt. By then, James K. Polk, a champion of expansion, sat in the White House. Before the war with Mexico in 1846, the region that today constitutes the American Southwest was claimed first by Spain, then Mexico, when in reality, the land had belonged to Indian peoples. In Texas, in addition to farming tribes like the Caddo's with a deep historic presence in the area, nomadic peoples like the Kiowas, Comanches, and Lipan Apaches vied for dominance. Not only did these Indian nations remain independent on the northern frontiers of Mexico, but they also were actually expanding. They incorporated other native peoples into their societies and, in some cases, pushed back the Hispanic frontier. The movement of Indian nations, the emergence and competition of the Mexican and American nation states, and the intrusion of new economic forces made the southern plains a volatile region in which people shifted loyalties and sometimes identities according to changing circumstances, opportunities, and imperatives. As it had throughout the 18th century, Indian power shaped the outcome of imperial struggles. Comanches and neighboring tribes who had raided south of the Rio Grande for years escalated their incursions in the 1830s and 1840s. Their attacks diverted and drained Mexican resources, drove away Mexican settlers, left whole areas devastated, and generated political instability. By the time American armies marched in, the Comanches, Kiowas, and Apaches had rendered Mexico's northern provinces ripe for conquest. After Texans won their independence from Mexico in 1836, Sam Houston became the first president of the Republic of Texas. Houston tried to pursue a policy of negotiation in dealing with Indians, especially with immigrant Cherokees, Shawnees, and Delawares, who he hoped might form a buffer between Texan settlements and raiding Comanches, Kiowas, and other Plains tribes. But in 1838, Miro B. Lamar, a Texan from Georgia, became president. Lamar despised Houston and his conciliatory Indian policy, and he initiated a policy of ethnic cleansing to drive all Indians out of Texas. Indians and whites could not live side by side, said Lamar. The proper policy to be pursued toward the barbarian race is absolute expulsion from the country. Anglo-Texans drove the Cherokees and Shawnees north into what is now Oklahoma and pushed the Comanches and other Plains tribes into western Texas. A Texan army routed the Cherokees, and when a delegation of 35 Comanches came with their women and children to a peace council at San Antonio in 1840, Texans first seized the chiefs and then, in the ensuing fight, killed the delegates. Texas plunged into bitter warfare. Comanche raiders struck settlements, killing people and carrying off captives and livestock. Texas rangers struck Comanche villages, looting and killing indiscriminately. Houston returned as president in 1841, but he could do little to stem the tide of violence. The Texas Rangers are often regarded as a heroic frontier police force, but many were vigilante companies motivated by hatred of Indians and a desire for plunder. In an environment of intense racial violence, fueled by fear, rumors, and reports of atrocities, Rangers often fell on camps of peaceful caddos rather than pursuing Comanches who remained beyond their reach on the high plains. After Texas entered the Union in 1845, the U.S. Cavalry carried out a policy of driving the Comanches onto reservations. Indians who were not on reservations were assumed to be hostile. The Cavalry hunted Indians on the plains and attacked them in their villages. Some northern Comanches clung to the panhandle, but dozens of tribes, both immigrants and those indigenous to Texas, were forced out. By 1859, writes one historian, Texas had become a conquered land. The campaigns against the Kiowas and Comanches continued. In 1835, some 35,000 Indians lived in Texas. Forty years later, they were all but gone.
Texans had sought admission to the Union almost since winning their independence from Mexico in 1836, but any suggestion of adding another slave state to the Union outraged most Northerners, who applauded westward expansion but imagined the expansion of liberty, not slavery. John Tyler, who became president in April 1841 when William Henry Harrison died one month after taking office, understood that Texas was a dangerous issue because of slavery. Adding to the danger, Great Britain began sniffing around Texas, apparently contemplating adding the young republic to its growing empire. In 1844, Tyler, who was a passionate expansionist, decided to risk annexing the Lone Star Republic. Predictably, howls of protest erupted across the North. Future Massachusetts Senator Charles Sumner deplored the insidious plan to annex Texas and carve from it great slaveholding states. The Senate soundly rejected the annexation treaty. During the election of 1844, the Whig nominee for president, Henry Clay, in an effort to woo Northern voters, came out against annexation of Texas. Annexation and war with Mexico are identical, he declared. But the Democratic nominee, Tennessean James K. Polk, vigorously backed annexation. The Senate soundly rejected the annexation treaty. During the election of 1844, the Whig nominee for president, Henry Clay, in an effort to woo Northern voters, came out against Texas annexation. Annexation and war with Mexico are identical, he declared. But the Democratic nominee, Tennessean James K. Polk, vigorously backed annexation. To make annexation acceptable to Northerners, the Democrats cleverly yoked the annexation of Texas to the annexation of Oregon, thus tapping the desire for expansion in the free states of the North as well as in the slave states of the South. The Democratic platform called for the re-annexation of Texas and the reoccupation of Oregon. The statement that the United States was merely reasserting existing rights was poor history, but good politics. When Clay finally recognized the popularity of expansion, he waffled, hinting that he might accept the annexation of Texas after all. His retreat succeeded only in alienating anti-slavery opinion in the North. James G. Burney, the candidate of the New Liberty Party, denounced Clay as rotten as a stagnant fish pond and picked up the votes of thousands of disillusioned Clay supporters. In the November election, Polk won a narrow victory. In his inaugural address on March 4, 1845, Polk defended America's manifest destiny. This heaven-favored land, he proclaimed, enjoyed the most admirable and wisest system of well-regulated self-government ever devised by human minds. He asked, Who shall assign limits to the achievements of free minds and free hands under the protection of this glorious union? The nation did not have to wait for Polk's inauguration to see the results from his victory. One month after the election, President Tyler announced that the triumph of the Democratic Party provided a mandate for the annexation of Texas promptly and immediately. In February 1845, after a fierce debate between anti-slavery and pro-slavery forces, Congress approved a joint resolution offering the Republic of Texas admission to the United States. Texas entered as the 15th slave state. While Tyler delivered Texas, Polk had promised Oregon, too. Westerners particularly demanded that the new president make good on the Democratic pledge 5440 or fight, that is, all of Oregon right up to Alaska. 54 degrees 40 minutes was the southern latitude of Russian Alaska. But Polk was close to war with Mexico and could not afford a war with Britain over U.S. claims in Canada. He renewed an old offer to divide Oregon along the 49th parallel. Westerners cried betrayal, but when Britain accepted the compromise, the nation gained an enormous territory peacefully, more importantly, also a deep water port in the Puget Sound, which gave access to Asia trade. When the Senate approved the treaty in June 1846, the United States and Mexico were already at war. From the day he entered the White House, Polk craved Mexico's remaining northern provinces, California and New Mexico, land that today makes up California, Nevada, Utah, most of New Mexico and Arizona, and parts of Wyoming and Colorado. Since the 1830s, Indians had attacked Mexican ranches and towns, killing thousands, and Polk pointed to Mexico's inability to control its northern provinces to undermine its claims to them. 
The president hoped to buy the territory, but when the Mexicans refused to sell, he concluded that military force would be needed to realize the United States' manifest destiny. Polk ordered General Zachary Taylor to march his 4,000-man army 150 miles south from the Nueces River, the southern boundary of Texas, according to the Mexicans, to the banks of the Rio Grande, the boundary claimed by Texans. Viewing the American advance as aggression, Mexican cavalry on April 25, 1846, attacked a party of American soldiers, killing or wounding 16. On May 11, the president told Congress, Mexico has passed the boundary of the United States, has invaded our territory, and shed American blood upon American soil. Thus, war exists, and notwithstanding all our efforts to avoid it, exists by the act of Mexico herself. Congress passed a declaration of war and began raising the army. The U.S. Army was pitifully small, only 8,600 soldiers. Faced with the nation's first foreign war against a Mexican army that numbered more than 30,000, Polk called for volunteers. More than 30,000 Tennesseans competed for the state's 3,000 allotted positions. Eventually, more than 112,000 white Americans, 40% of whom were immigrants, African Americans were banned, joined the army to fight in Mexico. Despite the flood of volunteers, the war divided the nation. Northern Whigs in particular condemned the war. The Massachusetts legislature claimed that the war was being fought for the triple object of extending slavery, of strengthening the slave power, and of obtaining control of the free states. On January 12, 1848, a gangly freshman Whig representative from Illinois rose in the House of Representatives and likened the president's views to the half-insane mumbling of a fever dream. He proclaimed Polk a bewildered, confounded, and miserably perplexed man. Before Abraham Lincoln sat down, he had questioned Polk's intelligence, honesty, and sanity. The president ignored the upstart representative, but anti-slavery, anti-war Whigs kept up the attack throughout the conflict. President Polk expected a short war in which U.S. armies would occupy Mexico's northern provinces and defeat the Mexican army in a decisive battle or two, after which Mexico would sue for peace and the United States would keep the territory its armies occupied. At first, Polk's strategy seemed to work. In May 1846, Zachary Taylor's troops drove south from the Rio Grande and routed the Mexican army, first at Palo Alto, then at Resaca de la Palma. Old Rough and Ready, as Taylor's troops called him, became an instant war hero. Polk rewarded Taylor for his victories by making him commander of the Mexican campaign. A second prong of the campaign centered on Colonel Stephen Watts Kearney, who led a 1,700-man army from Missouri into New Mexico. Without firing a shot, U.S. forces took Santa Fe in August 1846. Kearney then marched to San Diego, where he encountered a major Mexican rebellion against American rule. In January 1847, after several clashes and severe losses, U.S. forces occupied Los Angeles. California and New Mexico were in American hands. By then, Taylor had driven deep into the interior of Mexico. In September 1846, after house-to-house -house fighting, he had taken the city of Monterey. Taylor pushed his 5,000 troops southwest, where the Mexican hero of the Alamo, General Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana, was concentrating an army of 21,000 men. On February 23, 1847, Santa Ana's troops attacked Taylor at Buena Vista. The Americans won the day but suffered heavy casualties. The Mexicans suffered even greater losses, some 3,400 dead, wounded, and missing compared with 650 Americans. During the night, Santa Ana withdrew his battered army. Uninterrupted victories in northern Mexico fed the American troops' sense of invincibility. But the Americans worried about other hazards, however. Letters home told of torturous marches across deserts alive with tarantulas, scorpions, and rattlesnakes. Others recounted dysentery, malaria, smallpox, cholera, and yellow fever. Of the 13,000 American soldiers who died, some 50,000 Mexicans perished. Fewer than 2,000 fell to Mexican bullets and shells. Disease killed most of the others. Medicine was so primitive that, as one Tennessee man observed, nearly all who take sick die. Despite heavy losses on the battlefield, Mexico refused to trade land for peace. While Taylor occupied the north, 
Polk ordered General Winfield Scott to land an army on the Gulf Coast of Mexico and march 250 miles inland to Mexico City. The plan entailed enormous risk because Scott would have to cut himself off from supplies and lead his men deep into enemy country against a much larger army. An amphibious landing on March 9, 1847 near Veracruz put some 10,000 American troops ashore. After furious shelling, Veracruz surrendered. In April 1847, after gathering 9,300 wagons, 17,000 pack mules, 500,000 bushels of oats and corn, and 100 pounds of blister ointment, Scott's forces moved westward, following the path blazed more than three centuries earlier by Hernan Cortez to Mexico City. After the defeat at Buena Vista, Santa Ana had returned to Mexico City, where he rallied his ragged troops and marched them east to set a trap for Scott in the mountain passes at Cerro Gordo. Knifing through Mexican lines, the Americans almost captured Santa Ana, who fled the field on foot. So complete was the victory that Scott gloated to Taylor, Mexico no longer has an army. But Santa Ana again rallied the Mexican army. Some 30,000 troops took up defensive positions on the outskirts of Mexico City and began melting down church bells to cast new cannons. In August 1847, Scott began his assault on the Mexican capital. The fighting proved the most brutal of the war. Santa Ana backed his army into the city, fighting each step of the way. At the Battle of Churubusco, the Mexicans took 4,000 casualties in a single day and the Americans more than 1,000. At the castle of Chapultepec, American troops scaled the walls and fought the Mexican defenders hand-to-hand. -hand. After Chapultepec, Mexican city officials persuaded Santa Ana to evacuate the city to save it from destruction, and on September 14, 1847, Scott rode in triumphantly. On February 2, 1848, American and Mexican officials signed the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in Mexico City. Mexico agreed to give up all claims to Texas north of the Rio Grande and to cede the provinces of New Mexico and California, more than 500,000 square miles, to the United States. The United States agreed to pay Mexico $15 million and to assume $3.25 million in claims that American citizens had against Mexico. Southerners clamored for the annexation of all of Mexico, drooling at the prospect of admitting a great many new states into the Union lying south of the Missouri Compromise Line where slavery would be legal, but Northerners decried such a move that would upset the delicate sectional balance over slavery. Many of them opposed the war on the grounds that the United States should only add territory through diplomatic negotiation and fair purchase, never by threats of war or outright war which surely must have made many an Indian chuckle bitterly. Polk may have been tempted briefly by the prospect of once again doubling the size of the nation, but easily dismissed it because of the aforementioned upsetting of the sectional balance, but more importantly because it would turn a country that had for its entire history defined itself as white Anglo-Saxon Protestant into one that was half brown Ibero Indian Catholic. Considering the religious hostility that the Catholic Irish immigrants were receiving at that time, the incorporation of tens of millions of non-white Catholics as U.S. citizens would have been too much for most white Americans to accept. In any case, the Mexicans themselves would not have welcomed such a conquest, and the expense and trouble of holding and administering an immense occupied territory populated by resentful and potentially rebellious people was definitely not an attractive prospect. The treaty gave Polk everything he had wanted and promised, and in March 1848, the Senate ratified the treaty. Polk had his Rio Grande border, his Pacific ports, and all the land that lay between. The American triumph had enormous consequences. The American triumph had enormous consequences. Less than three quarters of a century after its founding, the United States had achieved its self-proclaimed manifest destiny to stretch from the Atlantic to the Pacific, it would enter the industrial age with vast new natural resources and a two-ocean economy, while Mexico faced a sharply diminished economic future. Another consequence of the Mexican defeat was that California gold poured into American, not Mexican, pockets. In January 1848, James Marshall discovered gold in the American River in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada. His discovery set off the California Gold Rush, one of the wildest mining stampedes in the world's history. 
Between 1849 and 1852, more than 250,000 49ers, as the miners were known, descended on the Golden State. In less than two years, Marshall's discovery transformed California from foreign territory into a state. Gold fever quickly spread around the world. A flood of men of various races and nationalities poured into California, where they remade the quiet world of Mexican ranches into a roaring mining town economy. Only a few struck it rich, and life in the gold fields was nasty, brutish, and often short. The prospectors who filled Hangtown, Hell's Delight, Gouge Eye, and a hundred other crude mining camps faced cholera and scurvy, exorbitant prices, deadly encounters with claim jumpers, and endless back-breaking labor. By 1853, San Francisco had grown into a raw city of 50,000 that depended as much on gold as did the mining camps inland. Enterprising individuals learned that there was money to be made tending to the needs of miners. Hotels, saloons, restaurants, laundries, brothels, and stores of all kinds exchanged goods and services for miners' gold dust and nuggets. Violent crime was so common that in 1851, the Committee of Vigilance determined to bring order to the city. Lynchings proved the committee meant business. Establishing civic order was made more difficult by California's diversity and Anglo bigotry. The Chinese attracted special scrutiny. By 1851, 25,000 Chinese lived in California, and their religion, language, dress, long pigtails, eating habits, and use of opium convinced many Anglos that they were not fit citizens of the Golden State. In 1850, the California legislature passed the Foreign Miners Tax Law, which levied high taxes on non-Americans to drive them from the gold fields, except as hired laborers. The Chinese were restricted to certain residential areas and occupations and, along with blacks and Indians, denied public education and the right to testify in court. Opponents demanded a halt to Chinese immigration, but Chinese leaders in San Francisco fought back. Admitting deep cultural differences, they insisted that, in the important matters we are good men, we honor our parents, we take care of our children, we are industrious and peaceable, we trade much, we are trusted for small and large sums, we pay our debts, and are honest, and of course must tell the truth. Their protests offered little protection, however, and racial violence grew. Anglo-American prospectors asserted their dominance over other groups, including the Californios, Spanish and Mexican settlers who had lived in California for decades. Despite the U.S. government's pledge to protect Mexican and Spanish land titles, Americans took the land of the rancheros and through discriminatory legislation pushed Hispanic professionals, merchants, and artisans into the ranks of unskilled labor. Mariano Vallejo, a leading Californio, said of the 49ers, the good ones were few and the wicked many. Californians and Indians would have agreed. For them, the gold rush was a disaster. Numbering some 150,000 when the gold rush began, the Indian population dropped to less than 30,000 by 1860. 49ers killed many. One observer described white behavior toward Indians during the gold rush as, one of the last human hunts of civilization and the basest and most brutal of them all. The government of California sanctioned a war of extermination until the Indian race becomes extinct. In California, the Indian population was shattered by the massive upheavals that followed the discovery of gold. Americans in California routinely depicted the native inhabitants as degenerate and primitive, little better than wild animals. Miners, settlers, and volunteer companies hunted down Indians in systematic campaigns of extermination. When Pomo Indians killed two avaricious miners who had ruthlessly exploited their Indian laborer, American soldiers retaliated in 1850, killing more than 100 Pomo men, women, and children in a perfect slaughter pen, according to the officer commanding the troops. Historians disagree about whether it is appropriate to use the term genocide in American Indian history. Those who first addressed the question head-on often tended to be polemical. Their work was suggestive and provocative, but of uneven quality and limited usefulness. Other historians have too easily dismissed the term as not applicable to the United States. But genocide studies is now an established field of scholarship, and scholars of Native American genocide now engage in painstaking accumulation of evidence rather than sweeping generalizations. 
If genocide occurred anywhere in the United States, it seems, it occurred in California in the wake of the gold rush. Genocide is a term of awful significance, wrote the late historian Tom Hagen, but one which has application to the story of California's Native Americans. Many scholars today agree. Whether it is called genocide, ethnic cleansing, or simply mass murder, there seems little doubt that California became a killing field where white vigilante groups carried out mass killings and many more people through apathy, inaction, or tacit support allowed it to happen. Between 1846 and 1873, state and federal policies, vigilante violence, destruction of villages and food resources, unfree labor, kidnapping, reservation neglect, lack of legal protection, disease, and mass murders reduced California's Indian population by 80%. The influx of thousands of single men to work the gold fields put Indian women in a precarious and often perilous position. Some men turned to Native women for companionship and lasting relationships. But unlike fur traders, miners did not need to establish long-term relationships with Native women or kinship ties with Native communities to achieve their economic goals. Many men turned on Indian women in acts of sexual violence. Poverty and starvation forced some women into prostitution. Thousands of women and children throughout California were sold into slavery. Many white Californians depended on Indian labor on their ranches, and capturing and indenturing or selling Indian children was common. When California achieved statehood in 1850, ranchers lobbied hard to get the state to implement an Indian code, which, like the slave codes in the South, would regulate and control the labor force. The delegates to California's Constitutional Convention voted unanimously to prohibit slavery in California, but they were thinking of black slavery, not Indian slavery. California Indians were to remain a subservient class of laborers without political rights and with inferior legal rights. Contemporary stereotypes depicted California Indians as dissolute and idle. Under California's laws, Indians were free, but they were not free to be idle. The 49ers created dazzling wealth. In 1852, 81 million ounces of gold, nearly half of the world's production, came from California. However, most miners never struck it rich and eventually took up farming, opened small businesses, or worked for wages for the corporations that took over the mining industry. Other Americans traded furs, hides, and lumber and engaged in whaling and the China trade in tea, silk, and porcelain. Still, as one observer noted, California was separated by thousands of miles of plains, deserts, and almost impossible mountains from the rest of the Union. Some dreamers imagined a railroad that would someday connect the Golden State with the thriving agriculture and industry of the East. Others imagined a country transformed not by transportation, but by progressive individual and institutional reform. During the 1840s and 1850s, abolitionists continued to struggle to focus the nation's attention on the plight of African-American slaves and the need for emancipation. Former slaves Frederick Douglass, Henry Bibb, and Sojourner Truth lectured to reform audiences throughout the North about the cruelties of slavery. Abolitionists published newspapers, held conventions, and petitioned Congress, but they never attracted a mass following among white Americans. Many white Northerners became convinced that slavery was wrong, but they still believed that blacks were inferior. Many other white Northerners shared the common view of white Southerners that slavery was necessary and even desirable. The westward expansion of the nation during the 1840s offered abolitionists an opportunity to link their unpopular ideal to a goal that many white Northerners found much more attractive limiting the geographic expansion of slavery, an issue that moved to the center of national politics during the 1850s. Black leaders rose to prominence in the abolitionist movement during the 1840s and 1850s. African Americans had actively opposed slavery for decades, but a new generation of leaders arose in these years. Frederick Douglass, Henry Highland Garnett, William Wells Brown, Martin R. Delaney and others became impatient with white abolitionists' appeals to the consciences of white people. In 1843, Garnet urged slaves to choose liberty or death and rise in insurrection against their masters, an idea that alienated almost all white people and had little influence among slaves. To express their own uncompromising ideas, 
black abolitionists founded their own newspapers and held their own anti-slavery conventions, although they still cooperated with sympathetic whites. The commitment of black abolitionists to battling slavery grew out of their own experiences with white supremacy. The 250,000 free African Americans in the North and West made up less than 2% of the total population by 1860. They faced the humiliations of racial discrimination in nearly every arena of daily life. Only Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Vermont, where few African Americans lived, permitted black men to vote. New York imposed a special property holding requirement on black, but not white, voters, effectively excluding most black men from the ballot box. Widespread racial discrimination both handicapped and energized black abolitionists. Some cooperated with the efforts of the American Colonization Society to send freed slaves and other black Americans to Liberia in West Africa. Others sought to move to Canada, Haiti, or elsewhere. Most black American leaders, however, refused to support immigration. Instead, they insisted that they deserved the same rights as white Americans. They worked against racial prejudice in their own communities, organizing campaigns against segregation, particularly in transportation and education. Their most notable success came in 1855 when Massachusetts integrated its public schools. Elsewhere, uncompromising white supremacy reigned. Outside the public spotlight, Free African Americans in the North and West contributed to the anti-slavery cause by quietly aiding fugitive slaves. Harriet Tubman escaped from slavery in Maryland in 1849 and repeatedly risked her freedom and her life to return to the South to escort slaves to freedom. When the opportunity arose, free blacks in the North provided fugitive slaves with food, a safe place to rest, and a helping hand. This Underground Railroad ran mainly through black neighborhoods, black churches, and black homes. It grew from the belief in abolition and opposition to white supremacy that unified nearly all African Americans in the North and West. During the 1840s and 1850s, a cluster of changes, population growth, steam power, railroads, and the growing mechanization of agriculture and manufacturing meant greater economic productivity a burst of output from farms and factories, and prosperity for many. Diplomacy with Great Britain and war with Mexico handed the United States 1.2 million square miles and more than 1,000 miles of Pacific coastline. One prize of Manifest Destiny, California, almost immediately rewarded its new owners with tons of gold. Most Americans believed that the new territory and vast riches were appropriate rewards for the nation's stunning economic progress and superior institutions. To Americans in the North and West, industrial evolution confirmed the choice they had made to promote free labor as the key to independence, equality, and prosperity. Like Abraham Lincoln, millions of Americans could point to their personal experiences as evidence of the practical truth of the free labor ideal. But millions of others knew that poverty and wealth continued to rub shoulders in the free labor system. Free labor enthusiasts denied that the problems lay in the country's social and economic systems. Instead, they argued, inequality sprang from individual failures. Some reformers focused on personal self-control and discipline, such as avoiding sin and alcohol. Other reformers agitated for women's rights and the abolition of slavery. They challenged male supremacy and black inferiority, but did not overcome the prevailing free labor ideal based on individualism, racial prejudice, and male superiority. By the 1850s, the North and West had economic interests, cultural values, and political aims that differed from those of the South. Each region celebrated its self-image and increasingly criticized the others. Not even the victory over Mexico could bridge the deepening divide between the North and West on one side and the South on the other side.